we're um, at time, but we'll just wait maybe a couple of minutes, just two or three more minutes uh, before we get things started. Okay, let's start. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who are joining us um, also over YouTube and other platforms, thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your afternoon to join us for yet another edition of the CEW Parishad Conversations. Uh, this comes in, in a series of online conversations that we're having on a variety of topics that CEW works on, and, and today's conversation is brought to you by the CEW Center for Energy Finance. Uh, for those of you who have joined us for other conversations recently, uh, you will know that uh, CEW has just completed 10 years of operations, and during this time, our value proposition of uh, leveraging data using integrated analysis and strategic outreach to sort of explain and change the use, misuse, and reuse of resources um, is something that you know we worked on extensively, and then it's sort of that's the, the the running theme across all our work. So it, it's no surprise then that today's discussion is also on the importance of more data and data transparency in when we start thinking about you know uh, building depth in the clean energy markets. And so the Center for Energy Finance that is actually set up to kind of de-risk and uh, bridge the information asymmetry in the clean energy markets uh, is then bringing to you today the first edition of the Clean Energy Finance uh, Market Handbook, which gives you kind of a snapshot overview of what's been happening in the world of, the, of uh, India's clean energy markets in the past quarter. Today we'll be talking about the, the quarter that is um, the, the first quarter of 2020, 2021, um, the quarter that's just closed. And uh, my colleague Nikhil is going to uh, be presenting kind of a snapshot of the various advances that we've seen across renewable energy, uh, electric vehicles, but also on the policy side, as well as in sort of manufacturing and, and a lot of the varied uh, interlinked sectors that, that, um, that are currently evolving as we speak. We also have with us today to discuss all of these advances, but also the importance of, the, of more transparency and of uh, talking not just about what is happening in the market, but why is it happening and why is that important. Um, very award-winning and well-reputed uh, journalist Akshat Rati, who is with Bloomberg News, but has previously also been with Quartz and um, The Conversation, and is also an editor of a volume of essays from Young Climate Leaders. So we will hear from Akshat in just a moment, but without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague Nikhil to present the findings from the quarter gone by. Thanks a lot, Kanika. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks a lot for that introduction, Kanika. Uh, so lately, a lot has been happening in the clean energy markets in India, be it the lowest tariff being discovered in the solar sector or the first hybrid bids of India or the, or the increased focus of the government to reform the whole electricity uh, sector in order to uh, promote clean energy uh, penetration in the country. 
and because of such huge activity we feel that a lot of information gets generated and sometimes the key messages and key insights uh sort of get lost in the noise uh this in a way hampers decision making by key policy makers executives uh and investors so we thought of coming up with a quarterly market handbook which demystifies what happened in the last uh, quarter in a very crisp uh a slide deck so i have around 12 slides with me uh with very packed and dense uh data and insights which uh which should be very handy for any key executive or policy maker uh, who makes decision in the uh, clean energy sector it's it spans across nine areas now because the data is so dense i won't be able to cover all of the insights that we have generated in the interest of time but i'm broadly going to uh, cover one or one or two major key insights from each of these sectors um so on the capacity front uh, as we know due to the aftermath of covid-19 uh, nationwide lockdown we have seen disruptions in the supply chain of uh, uh, renewable energy and which clearly shows a, as a sharp decline in the capacity that got commissioned in the last quarter that is q1 of fy21 but surprisingly we saw an impressive 12.4 gigawatt of capacity that got sanctioned or auctioned in the first quarter Uh, now this 12.4 gigawatt is nearly around 14% of the current installed capacity uh, which is around 87.7 uh, gigs interestingly uh, since fy18 we haven't added any gas diesel nuclear or hydro capacities in india so primarily it's been uh, kind of like coal versus uh, re where in the last uh, 10 years coal has grown at an average uh, annual rate of around 9% uh, versus re growing at around uh, at 19% uh, but since that has been of a relatively low base of 15.5 gigawatts uh, from fy10 uh, in order to uh, meet our 450 gigawatt targets by 2030 we probably need to go around grow around uh, 16% uh, to reach uh, these uh, targets uh moving on on the energy mix uh of course due to the nationwide lockdown there was a significant decline in the energy net energy generated in india uh which was around 15.9 when we compared it to the same quarter in the last fiscal year that is q1 of fy20 uh interestingly this decline in the uh energy production came primarily from coal uh and lignite sectors which went down by around 24.2% if we compare uh last year's generation in the same quarter uh and from a share of total generation perspective uh re increased from 9.9% to 11.8% uh similarly even hydro increased from 10.0% to 12.1% and uh as stated earlier coal declined from 73.1% share in the energy mix to 65.9% in this quarter uh moving on to the coal phase out or the coal capacity being uh being commissioned uh it's it can be clearly seen that in the last four quarters though we have been net positive in terms of you know uh, adding uh, the capacity additions less the retirements of coal plants but uh, this these values have significantly de uh, declined in the last four quarters uh, and i guess particular this particularly is coming from the fact that since 2015 we haven't really had any case one or case two bids for coal capacities uh, and the older plants are now uh, starting to get uh, get retired on the coal financing bit as we know that uh, more than 40 gigawatts of uh, coal capacity is currently stressed and uh, more than 1 lakh crore of uh, more than 1 lakh inr crore of power sector loans have become nps uh, this has deterred the banks the private sector banks from lending in the uh, into the sector 
Uh, but PFC and RIC, the Power Finance Corporation, and combined with the Rural Electrification uh, Corporation, have still been lending to the sector uh, primarily for refinancing of the existing uh, core projects. But an interesting fact is that uh, since quarter two of FY19, the share of coal in their loan book has decreased from 63% to 58% uh, in the last quarter, which is Q4 of FY20. Uh, PFC hasn't really come out with the results of Q1 FY20, so we haven't put uh, that out. Uh, and and uh, in order to compensate for this uh, decrease in the coal assets, uh, PFC has been increasingly investing in uh, coal, uh, in, in renewable as well as in large hydro technologies. On the RE auctions bid, uh, I think this is one sector that saw most of the activity. We saw the lowest uh, solar tariff being discovered at INR 2.36 per kilowatt hour in the two gigawatt bid. That was primarily due to a uh, lot of international participation from companies backed by foreign investors, which led to really high competition and drove down the prices significantly. We also saw uh, India's first hybrid bids being concluded. Now, what I mean by hybrid is basically combining different RE technologies, be it solar, wind, or uh, energy storage. And the tariffs discovered were to the tune of uh, 4.04 INR per kilowatt hour for an assured peak power supply of six hours. That was one of the bids. And the recent one being uh, 3.60 INR per kilowatt hour for round the clock energy supply uh, with a minimum of 80% CUF uh, re uh, requirement. Now, uh, the changing, uh, the evolving uh, RE sector and increasing RE penetration uh, into the discounts grid has, uh, has made them demand for more of these kinds of bids. So going forward, we'll see more of hybrids and storage linked uh, bids uh, in the future. Uh, Moving on, um, so the payment risk, uh, which is the risks, risk uh, posed to the power producers or uh, the Genkos from, uh, from the discoms in terms of uh, payment for their energy bills is one of the most crucial risks, uh, uh, especially to the RE sector in India. And owing to the nationwide uh, COVID-19 pandemic in the last three months or from March 2020, the dues from discounts to the power producers have risen by around 30% and have reached around 1,30,895 crore uh, as of June 2020. Uh, this figure is up by nearly 71% from what we see uh, from the last year, uh, from last year, June uh, 2019. In terms of payable days, that is the, the days uh, that a typical discom takes to pay uh, these generators. Some of the some of the states, some of the RE states which are performing badly are Andhra Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Rajasthan, and Telangana. So uh, states, uh, these states I mentioned, take around 200 days to pay a typical bill uh, to a power producer. Now, just in context. Uh, uh, the typical deadline for an energy bill is around 30 days. So there's probably a delay of uh, more than 150 days in such case. Uh, in the last quarter, we saw a lot of activity in terms of the uh, power markets. Uh, one of the key reforms that was rolled out uh, by the government of India was the introduction of real-time markets, which was introduced in on the 1st of June. Uh, though uh, the volumes of uh, this market are currently a bit low due to a lack of capacity uh, with the states uh, and some teething issues uh, with the new market, but the price discovery has been quite uh, surprising uh, at 2.22 INR per kilowatt hour, which is even lower than the price discovered uh, on the day ahead spot market in India. So that's around 2.35 uh, uh, INR per kilowatt hour. Um, now, this is definitely going to play a crucial role in, in sort of uh, reducing the overall uh, power purchase costs in India, which constitutes nearly more than 80% of 
the electricity tariff in India. Uh, for the uh, REC market, that is the Renewable Energy Certificate market, uh, so, uh, CERC recently removed the tariff floor for the market. So this means that the market has started to mature and we'll see the prices being driven down even more uh, in the future uh, for this market. So which is, this is really good for the CNI customers and the large, uh, C the large CNI customers as well as discounts to uh, procure uh, RE power. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide on the policy and regulatory developments. I think it's too dense, but just wanted to state one point that uh, in the last few months, government of India proposed amendments to uh, the Electricity Act 2003. Now this uh, comes out as a major wave of reform, probably after 17 years, where uh, the government has been pushing to uh, set up uh, a central uh, electricity contract enforcement authority to resolve PPA related issues uh, within a span of 120 days. I think this is one of the key issues, uh, key risks in the RE sector. Some of the other major reforms rolled out include uh, direct benefits transfer, uh, uh, having a dedicated RE policy, uh, as well as re reduction in uh, cross subsidies in the tariff, which has uh, contribute, contributed to the low viability of the electricity sector as a whole. At CW Center for Energy Finance, we also track the capacities that get functioned every quarter and uh, every month. And we track the market concentration in the, in the RE market. Uh, now for the context, market concentration is basically the ratio of top five RE capacities sanctioned to the total RE capacity sanctioned in a quarter. So quite evidently, India's market is quite heavily concentrated with leading across leading players, Adani Green, Azure Power, Renew Power, SoftBank. Uh, and the market concentration for Q1 FY21 was uh, around uh, 81%. And uh, the concentration is expected to be high in the coming months as these large developers have easy and, and uh, cheap access or access to cheap finance, which is a significant contributor to, uh, uh, to tariffs. We also tracked uh, some of the key RE uh, shares or stocks, and we saw that, uh, uh, so we tracked them, uh, them since December 2019. We indexed them uh, uh, to 100. And from the graph on the slide, you can clearly see that despite the global shock in the markets, uh, RE stocks uh, have risen and uh, have gained quite a lot of investor interest. So you can see that the pure play RE developer stocks like Adani Green and Azure Power have increased significantly. Even the smaller uh, RE developer manufacturer stocks like Suzlan Energy and Inox Wind uh, have outperformed the Sen Sensex. Uh, on the other hand, some of the other stocks like uh, Sterling and Wilson and uh, Borsal Renewables have uh, not performed so well, but that has been due to specific issues like uh, a delayed promoter loan repayment overhang in the case of uh, Sterling and Wilson and some supply chain disruptions uh, in case of Porcel. On the debt side, uh, we also track the bond yields of some of the key uh, RE developers in India. Uh, so uh, they include NTPC, uh, Renew Power and Dani Green. Uh, now, Adani and uh, Renew Power have been the most active among RE developers in terms of uh, raising capital through inter international bond markets. And this has been primarily for refinancing of the existing projects as well as some of it uh, left over for, for capacity expansion. So in the graph on this slide, you can see that with the COVID uh, lockdown announcement, there was a temporary aberration uh, in the bond yields. You can see that the bond yields increased significantly or the bond prices dropped down significantly. But we can clearly see that in the following months, they, uh, they're they coming back to the pre-COVID levels. And interestingly, in the uh, during the same time, uh, RE stops for these companies, that is primarily RE and uh, Renew Power and Adani, uh, grew significantly uh, 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 during the same period. Can refer to the previous slide for this. 
on the storage side, I think uh, India, as I mentioned in the RE option slide before, uh, India concluded its first uh, hybrid uh, bid, first two actually. Uh, one of them was the Seki's assured peak power supply, which discovered a tariff of 4.04 uh, rupees per kilowatt hour. That's the levelized cost of energy. Uh, on the uh, if we compare the tariffs that are being discovered in the United States, uh, the lowest tariff recently discovered was 1.64 rupees or 21.90 uh, dollars per megawatt hour. Now, uh, this this kind of shows that uh, in terms of the PPA prices for India versus US, we are nearly five years behind. But uh, I think the 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 prices of uh, uh, of the overall solar or wind plus storage tariffs, as well as battery prices are declining with the supersizing of battery capacities for these kinds of projects. So typically these projects, uh, the batteries in, on the, in this project would be sized anywhere from 400 to 1200 megawatt hour, uh, thereby driving down the costs. And uh, in various discussion forums and uh, uh, conversations with Seki, uh, they have also stated that most of the discounts have been demanding for tenders or bids which uh, are firm uh, and flexible and dispatchable. So those are the kind of bids we expect to see in, in the future as uh, the RE share increases in India. I'm now going to move on to the last section of the slide deck, which talks about uh, electric mobility. Uh, so as quite expected due to the, the nationwide lockdown, uh, sales figures took quite a hit from uh, by about 72.4% if we compare uh, to the Q1 FY20 figures. Uh, uh, the sales were down from 60, around 60,000 to 16,000 in the Q1 of FY21. Uh, just for establishing the context, in India, most of the electric vehicle sales have been dominated by uh, typically two and three wheeler sales. And that's probably expected to be the trend uh, in the, at least in the uh, near future. Um, though we expect the festive season from September to November uh, to push the EV sales further, uh, also some of the pent up demand may push the EV sales overall in India. But there have been forecasts by uh, by CM uh, that have projected that overall sales for the coming financial year will be down by nearly 45%. So that's a significant decline uh, as to what was expected. Uh, and range anxiety and high prices remain one of the key challenges uh, in the sector. Uh, so overall, yeah, I mean, I think in the last three to six months, significant has happened in the sector. Uh, and uh, I wish I could cover all of the details, but uh, you may find this uh, uh, the CEF market handbook on our website, which is cef.cew.in. Uh, Kanika would have also shared the link uh, to the market handbook uh, in the chat box, so you can refer to that. And uh, I'd also like to point you out towards some of the other work that we have recently taken up, uh, which all of which you can find on our website, which is cef.cew.in. Uh, some of the recent works has been on the electric mobility dashboard. So that's a dedicated dashboard for the electric mobility sector in India that tracks all the key parameters and indicators. And we also have come up with an open access tool that helps a user determine uh, the open access charges for the corporate EPA market in India. So yeah, that's it from my side. Thanks a lot. What do you gonna Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you very much. That was uh, very interesting. I hope that everyone who's joined us today also found it interesting. As Nikhil mentioned, uh, this market handbook will be available uh, also in downloadable versions on our website. Please feel free to sort of, you know, ask us questions. If you have any feedback, please feel free to send us that and also, you know, share it with your colleagues. Um, I, I want to unpack some of uh, the, the the kind of findings that Nikhil presented to us. But before that, I also want to just talk a little bit about the value of doing something like this um, and the value of kind of having periodic 
uh, up to date information that is all um, well sourced so you kind of know that it's credible and and it tells a story and over time you have a much clearer picture of what's going on in these relatively young markets and and you know that's the, the kind of interesting thing about the clean energy markets in india is that they're quite sizable and so they can't really be ignored but they're still quite young and so some of the developments in the market are kind of um still teething problems in a large market so to speak right so maybe akshat will start with that what is the importance yeah. of kind of um, recognizing what's happening in the market and telling the story in a way that helps bridge the information asymmetry that that often you know puts people off from looking at these sectors because they're too new and there's not enough experience and things like that yeah um i think you know it would uh, be wrong if i don't start with bloomberg itself which was founded on that very idea so back in uh, the 80s uh, financial information was not transparently available and uh that that lack of transparency was exploited by some players in the market to uh, gain advantage uh, and make more money and uh the foundation of bloomberg was to try and democratize access to financial information and it's continued to do that uh, for the last three decades and four decades um and so in 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 the context of the indian energy industry um and specifically the renewable energy industry uh one thing that uh, again nikhil spoke about which is the bids are low the auctions are you know you're hitting these low, low record low prices partly because there is access, access to cheap capital from foreign investors in some of these uh, renewable energy companies and foreign investors will only come to a market if they are able to understand that market clearly uh and so i think this uh access to this data is is invaluable and i uh, and it's a really good idea that you've been able to put it together thank you um i will i have a few questions and and a little a few discussion points around some of the data points themselves but i'd also like to bring in all of our audience so if you're joining us through zoom please do use the q and a box to put in your questions uh and if you are joining us on other platforms and i guess you just leave your questions there and then we will answer them after because we don't actually have all of those in front of us at the moment but please we want to keep this as interactive as possible uh i want to sort of kick off with um, renewables which is really you know the most well developed of the clean energy markets in india uh, and perhaps also globally and uh nikhil from maybe i'll pose this to you when you were putting this together in times and i think you know you said this on slide after slide uh nationwide lockdown things got bad but then we saw bounce back right and while the whole country is debating what kind of recovery we're going to have what we see is that the green shoots so to speak in the green sectors are actually quite robust and and the, that sector hasn't really struggled as much i mean we've found uh some of the lowest uh bids or the tariff uh, has been discovered for solar during this time so uh what is your kind of like broad takeaway for anyone looking at the clean or that the solar and wind sector in india yeah thank you for your question i mean as stated by you i think uh despite covid or i would say because of covid sector maybe uh the focus of the government uh and investors in the global community at large has kind of shifted and gone in a reflection mode and uh as you can see it it just just not only shows in terms of the rising stock prices or an impressive capacity that we auction in this quarter uh i think uh i think overall the sector is poised to uh is poised uh to see growth significant growth in the coming years and uh, primarily coming from again as as akshit pointed out uh, increased uh, foreign investor interest in the country uh, also to establish some of the context that uh, you know even on at a global level uh, now that uh, even fed is kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, pushing liquidity into the market the investors are also flush with money and 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 the emerging uh, markets like india uh, are one of the areas where they want to uh, want to invest and and i think especially in the last 6 months with the 
electricity amendment act and uh, various fti cells being set up in the uh, in mnre or project managed for project development cells that is i think sent a good signal to the investors uh, in terms of policy certainty that there has been much more increased uh, intent mm. to reform the sector and i think uh, that is actually quite the foundation of the sector and uh, the the way to mitigate risks inherent to the sector that's a really good point actually and maybe if i take that to akshat and combine it with a few other developments that nikhil presented was um one is that you know we're seeing um a lot of large funds kind of moving away from thermal investments uh even uh, even within india the the present as nikhil presented pfc and rec are kind of you know the share of coal financing is going down plus there is you know this liquidity and and uh, looking for homes of investment and then if with the good track record of renewables in india do you think that this is all kind of spelling in a way um almost a boom that i mean you know one could imagine that the renewable story has already seen its boom but is the boom actually coming um or do you think that there will be sort of other challenges that we're just not being cognizant of at the moment yeah i think uh, it's true i mean there is liquidity in the market uh and investors are are keen to put their money uh in places where they'll get decent returns now in this moment nobody is really looking for high returns uh and so uh but there is i mean there is a huge challenge in what uh you know the indian broad economic story uh tells the investors as well right uh india's had to drop its uh, central bank rate to 4% which is which it's never done in the past so you know capital itself is is slightly more easily available in india um and you know as nikhil pointed out in his presentation the uh lack of money from the discounts which will pay these renewable uh, energy developers is uh, you know is a growing problem and if uh, you know if the indian government isn't able to provide certainty around those payments it's uh, you know it becomes a less attractive investment uh, than it otherwise would have been i think the fundamentals are right you know india is one of the lowest uh, cost energy re- renewable energy developer and will remain so um but uh you need policy certainty around uh this comp payments but also around sort of uh what happens to china and uh our relationships with china to uh, ensure that um imported solar panels are are still accessible so i i uh, right. like i mean we just one point uh shall i go ahead yes please yeah so uh from drawing from the point that akshad had said uh, around the discount payment i think i think the fundamental problem that's you know sort of exists there is lack of data transparency so you know when i was putting up this market and book uh, my key question was that okay how is renewables versus the conventional power sector doing in terms of payment and what i saw was that uh, you know that uh, most of the data is not there out there whatever is there is either on voluntary basis from the power producers which are probably suffering we don't really have a complete picture of what's happening in terms of payments for re versus the conventional uh, generators and what we hear at least from i mean only anecdotal evidence is that uh, maybe renewable is not so uh, suffering so much because it has again an intermediary like seki uh, as a which serves as a payment security mechanism uh, kind of so i think data transparency again is one of the key issues and uh, unless maybe there is a compulsory data disclosure on this because this is one of the bigger biggest risks in the market uh, yeah i think this will definitely sort of demotivate the investors but i think another aspect that we don't think about enough when we talk about the renewable story in india is uh, i mean while the focus has always been on access to affordable capital at scale for deployment what about financing sort of grid upgrades so that we can integrate more and more renewables into the grid right and and uh, the counterparty or discom uh, 
faced risk, so to speak, is partially because of their ability to pay and pay on time, but the other is also for them to be able to use all of the renewables that is being generated. Um, and especially now with you know power demand coming down um, and, and the growth definitely not going to be realized in this post-COVID paradigm, what kind of a challenge do you think that this is going to pose to the, the pace at which the transition happens in India? And Akshat, also, if you have experiences from other parts of the world that you'd like to share with us. Yeah, I mean, the grid upgrade story is an old one. This is essentially, you know, the first country to, the first region to really uh, invest in renewables uh, was California. And those co on conversations about whether the grid can handle variable renewables have uh, go back, you know, 30 years now. And yet what we have seen, especially in Europe and in California, uh, is you can go up to 70%, 80% variable renewables and it's fine. Uh, you know, the small grid upgrades so far have held on uh, pretty firmly. Um, that's been the case in India too. You know, India's uh, renewable, uh, the highest uh, in Nichols um, slides showed that, you know, we reached 16% uh, on, day, on, on, on some days. And um, I think, but we also know that the Indian grid is much more underdeveloped than, than the Western grid typically is. Um, and my conversations with renewable energy developers in India has been that so far the grid upgrades have held on and, and it's, it's a good story, but we do see the challenges coming in the, uh, in the years, in the next few years. And uh, it, it's just a signal that they try and keep sending to the government that please don't um, you know, stop grid upgrades uh, and because it will be a struggle at some point soon. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, just adding one point here, uh... I mean, I think the fact that uh, in the recent last maybe three to six months, there have been excessive, extensive demands from the discoms to, to SECI to come up with uh, new tenders, which are more firm uh, in terms of RE procurement or maybe even dispatchable and flexible uh, kind of shows or substantiates the fact that maybe they are facing difficulties in integration. But I think, uh, it's not just uh, in terms of grid upgradation, it's also, I think, there's a lack of capacity that needs to be developed. Uh, some of the discoms are ahead uh, technologically and in terms of capacity, they are more advanced. And you know, states like, say, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Gujarat are able to, or even Karnataka. On some of the days, Karnataka had 80% renewable in the grid. Uh, and uh, so, so maybe, maybe the laggard states need to learn from these leading states. Yeah. yeah. But I also think that, you know, you've raised a really important point, Nikhil, around the kind of innovation that we are seeing in the tender design, right? And um, often, especially when you think of high technology sectors and, and renewables and, and its allied sectors, I would call a sort of high technology sectors, we think of innovation only as technological innovation. But Actually, if from India's energy transition story, you see that there's so much innovation in market design, in kind of financing um, structures and business models. But in some ways, this is kind of, you know, innovation that we have not seen in other parts of the world as well. Like the, just the kind of tenders that, that are coming up, the, of course, there is hybrid tenders in other parts and there is, you know, solar plus storage, et cetera. But really making fit for purpose solutions um, through this process. I mean, what role do you think, Akshat, that this can play um, in really accelerating, you know, the, the pace at which DISCOMs absorb this renewable capacity and almost embrace it rather than, you know, almost, you know, with, with um, open arms as opposed to kind of begrudgingly, which is often what we see. Yeah, I think it's worth taking a step back here and, and just thinking through the fact that, you know, when uh, the first solar target was set, India's first solar target was set, a lot of people laughed off as saying it's too ambitious and we're never going to get there. And yet, and this is not just a story about India, this is true of goal setting around renewables, but also emissions, just generally, globally, that everybody thinks it's too ambitious and then we get there sooner than we think we would. Um, and the reason we are able to do that is because once you have a, a goal set, uh, you know, both governments and private companies have, uh, you know, a, a guiding light and they have a reason to talk to each other 
much more than they would have done otherwise. And in some ways, the Indian um, auctioning system and this sort of innovative auction bids that have come through where you're combining uh, different types of solar and uh, different types of renewables as assets, but also having this sort of round the clock auction. These are completely world first, first in, in many cases. And um, that's happening because there's a dialogue between government and private players, which again, in, in an Indian business sense, has always been a friction point uh, and the renewables energy industry is showing that you can overcome them uh, especially if the government has a target to meet. Um, and I think that is something that, you know, other uh, developing countries can certainly learn from India. Um, uh, before we shift, sorry, Nikhil, go ahead. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point raised by uh, Akshat. I just wanted to highlight it maybe once more that uh, it's absolutely right that in the last maybe few months, uh, we've definitely seen the policy makers, government agencies, very responsive to uh, what the industry is saying. Uh, I think earlier how the business environment used to work well was that it, there used to be a huge years and years of lag between where the industry is moving and where the policies are moving. And uh, so I think, yeah, I mean, we would definitely see a lot of innovation in terms of tender design uh, in the next few months in India, because the way at which we are uh, at least auctioning capacities, uh, the, the commissioning of these capacities will also sort of uh, get piled up, uh, maybe because of uh, the COVID-19 uh, supply chain disruptions. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, one of the other things that I find really remarkable and I feel like we don't perhaps celebrate it as much is the nimbleness of this uh, of the market design and of the various entities. So I think what I've really appreciated is that if you actually think about India's renewable energy story, it's been this past decade has been really like the decade of action, right? And even within this, the last five years have seen the, the larger spurt. Um, and in that time, there's been, of course, we focus a lot on the uncertainty and there has been some policy uncertainty, but there's also been policy nimbleness. There's been, you know, when we've had this kind of discount problem, we've kind of got these intermediaries in the form of SECI and NTPC. Uh, when we've seen integration troubles, we have now seen this kind of new tender design. Uh, we've seen co-location. Uh, when must run has become slightly difficult to implement, we've seen kind of, you know, regulation that, that enforces forecasting requirements, which are all steps in the right direction. And I think that this goes to the point that Akshat, you made right up front about the fundamentals are strong. This is not to say that you know macroeconomic troubles or power sector overall legacy issues will not continue to plague and hamper investments. But I, I think that it's also important to kind of state up front because this is not a common occurrence in, in India. This is, you know, it, usually policy making and decision making follows set processes and it's very hard to get um, it to be sort of as quick paced as as uh, the technology itself. And renewables is like a quick uh, feedback loop technology, very short gestation period between tendering and operations, often, you know, as little as 18 months. So we're learning as we go and we're learning at that pace. And I think that that's something that we should, def that's also why this kind of recurring information is important because a lot changes in a quarter. Otherwise, it seems like, you know, the same information every quarter seems a bit of an overkill. But in this case, a quarter may often actually seem like a lot has happened and, you know, you haven't given me an update. Before we switch uh, to uh, mobility and maybe even a talk a little bit about energy storage, I want to just address the two questions that we have received. Um, the first one is around payment delays. Uh, and if you have state-wise information and, and Nikhil, it'd be good if you could take that. And then the second one is around market incentives for reducing the financial loss of discounts, right? And that's really a catch-all question. And I, uh, I think it's a great question, but it's also the question that if we had the answer to, then you know, the power sector would not be um, a labor of love as it is for so many of us. But maybe I'll pose that to Akshat yeah. and let him take a stab at that. Um, okay, so Nikhil, do you want to tell us uh, what data you do have uh, on payment delays? Yeah, I mean, I, I would. It would be great, great if I had this data of payments receivables <laughs> to Seki. Unfortunately, yeah, Seki doesn't uh, reveal any, any data. But well, what we, I think that that would be really interesting to know that what kind of payment schedules are the Seki projects 
undergoing versus the state ones. But as anecdotal evidence suggests, uh, that SECI payments are pretty much on time. It's uh, it's the it's for those projects which are directly contracted with the states, which are a problem. I think primarily because of that reason, you don't see many of the state bids coming out now. Mostly, all of these states uh, request SECI uh, to tender out the uh, capacity. But an important point here, if I could just add, is uh, we do have state level data, which you, if you download yeah. this deck, you will see. But uh, it's important also, the SECI point is important because all the SECI power purchase agreements are actually predicated on SECI also having power sale agreements with different discoms, right? So if the discoms don't pay SECI in time, SECI cannot pay onward. Um, and this has been actually a slight change that they've made in new PPAs. In the old PPA, SECI would pay you regardless. So, uh, of course, SECI as a central government agency and with all of its, um, you know, preferential agreements that, and status that it has, it is better suited to recover the money, but it isn't completely any longer insured against that kind of, you know, delays. Um, and it's also important to kind of keep in mind that SECI is not a very large entity, so its balance sheet is not very large as well. Um, so a lot of the exposure that it's taking, because it is a central government agency kind of also exposes the government uh, to some kinds of risks. And we'd be, uh, we're keen to sort of look into that if this data became available and provide you all a bit more insight on that. Uh, but maybe we'll switch to discombos and, and hear from Akshat. I, again, I, I wouldn't have solutions. I think one thing that I've uh, really enjoyed uh, reading about and, and um, is something that we don't talk about, which is in India, we have a, a development of mini grids happening. Um, and this is, it's a story, mainly a sub-Saharan Africa and India story, uh, or some of it, some Southeast Asian countries too. And I think that's a, it's a really powerful way in which you can make um, typically the customers who end up don't paying when grid services come around to start paying when they have mini grids, which eventually will get connected to the large grids. And so if you're able to figure out uh, payments, payment options for rural customers who are connected to renewable energy assets uh, and maybe a diesel generator, uh, then, you know, when the grid electricity comes, which will be cheaper, they won't feel the pinch and they'll, there will be a system to make it work. Um, and, you know, India has a system of handouts for a reason. Um, and, um, but if there is a way in which you can um, understand which handouts are really worth it and which are not, mm. uh, that would also be, be a very welcome change. Right. Um, but uh, I can I also... You... Yeah, I can also give my two cents on the discom uh, wars. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, that uh, problem which I'm sure stated as uh, it's absolutely right. That's the way to go about it. Uh, but also wanted to point out one simple point that uh, that quite unlike the other countries like uh, maybe South Africa or African countries or even China, yeah, India's access story has uh, got. Uh, drastically transformed in the last two to three years, you know, after the Sobhagya scheme and we connected every household. So I think the next level of development in terms of uh, developing the rural communities is improving reliability and particularly targeting these uh, uh, rural commercial shop owners or small shops, uh, which are heavily dependent on electricity uh, and are relying on as Akshat said on mini grid technologies or you know off grid technologies for running their operations. So uh, yeah, I mean focus on that is definitely needed and probably it can be done through alternative models, uh, alternative public private prior shift models. The government has proposed to do some pilots. They have proposed to uh, privatize the union territory farms in India and maybe then scale it up to other states. So it seems like a good move. Uh, in terms of uh, implementing a change at scale. Right. Um, and, and maybe then for me as well um, on the loss of discoms and how to fix that. I think there's uh, the focus has often been on the, the, the poor financial health. So let's just, you know, bail them out. And uh, the Uday scheme, yeah. uh, evidence from the Uday scheme actually shows that uh, bailouts and throwing money at a problem isn't often, is 
often not the solution. And every single discoms challenges are slightly different from each other. Um, and in that sense, actually, that is exactly, I think, uh, is the, the best tell of why electricity continues to be both a state and a central subject because every state has a unique scenario. Um, so in some states, it's because of subsidies, which is something, again, that the amendment to the Electricity Act also touches upon, um, where, where the subsidy, where the, you're basically making a net loss on every unit of electricity that you're selling to certain classes, if not all. Um, but also often it's because of, you know, bill recovery, it's because of, you know, uh, upgrades that the discoms have to pay for, things like that. So I think that there isn't one solution, but it's important to identify the challenge before you try and solve it. And so to me, again, I think I go back to sort of data evidence and evidence based policy making rather than just uh, write offs, which kind of only result in the problem reoccurring. As Nikhil showed, 71% increase in discount debt in 12 months is um, not something that seems like it's been solved at all, right? Um, so with that, without giving you an answer to that question, but really giving you a suite of options, we'll move, move a little bit to a more emerging story. I would say renewables is the most um, off the lot, the most incumbent, but uh, mobility is still something that um, where electric vehicles, the case for them is still less compelling in certain classes, of course, like for fleets, et cetera, we see the economics to be already quite good. But then there is still the challenges around, you know, public charging, challenges around um, what are the, the evolving kind of policy space and where is the government really at on this? I mean, the government's had huge success in setting a very clear policy target for renewables, but they have not replicated that. Even though, of course, there is Niti Aayog has set a, a kind of direction of travel of where we what we should be aspiring for and certain states have policies. But there isn't the same kind of national level push. Um, so maybe again, starting with you, Akshat, what do you think is, um, do you think that that is one of the reasons why we've seen slower progress or, or can that be attributed to other things as well? Again, I take a step back and if you, this is a very uh, easy to find chart, so somebody should Google it. Uh, but if you look at the cost declines of renewable energy technologies, batteries have had the steepest decline. So we think of it as a solar story because obviously solar going back into the 70s mm -hmm. is, you know, is a huge decline. But batteries in the last 10 years have had the fastest decline in costs. Um, and we know that the cost of uh, electric vehicles is currently being held back because of the cost of batteries. What we can be, you know, to some extent certain is that it will come, that point of parity uh, will come sooner than we think because of the, the pace at which costs are declining. And India is really well suited for the electric mobility revolution. First, because we don't have that good public transport. So we, as we get richer, we are all people are going to try and find means to move around and they're going to have to either buy vehicles or rely on some form of, um, of fleet vehicles available to them. Um, and second, uh, you know, India has a has a very different way of doing this. So uh, we, the government may not be able to provide the sort of incentives that you know we've seen in Norway or even in China um, to make those vehicles cheap. And so we'll get to a point where they suddenly do become uh, cheap, and we'll see an explosion from that point rather than this sort of gradual increase that we've seen in other markets. Um, and so I think there's all reasons for private players to think about this market because uh, you know, a, an inflection point is coming and those who are well ready for that inflection point will be able to uh, make money off it. So that's whether that is um, automakers, uh, you know, again, two wheelers, three wheelers, four wheelers, or, um, or you know, electric charging companies, there'll be a huge explosion for demand for them. Um, and uh, and for battery makers, you know, uh, one of the things that is unlike other renewable technologies, you will need to have a battery manufacturing setup in this country, because the moving costs of batteries are much more high, is much higher because they're they're um, you know hazardous materials to move around. Um, so you combine all that, and you know, I think it's it's sort of a blind spot right now. Uh, the EV sector in India, but you know, it really could be something special. Nikhil? 
Yeah, I mean, just maybe a couple of points. Uh, yeah, so we need two things. We need a clear strategy on battery manufacturing and a clear strategy on target for electric vehicles. But I guess, I mean, if you ask the typical customer of an electric vehicle, I think the first question he would ask you is that uh, where are the chargers? So I think the range anxiety is going to be the biggest challenge. And I, I, in my opinion, I don't think uh, private sectors, unless incentivized correctly, will be the ones who pitch in. Uh, so yeah, again, either we, uh, either the, there's a central government push for setting up a uh, private uh, offer, setting up of public charges, or, or there's a, uh, in terms of incentives, or there's an agency which kind of, uh, you know, leads this process, which I think is happening with EESL kind of uh, leading the, uh, the charging, the setting up of charging stations. Yeah. I mean, I think that if you also asked uh, the average customer or potential customer of an electric vehicle, um, in addition to charging stations, you would also ask, uh, where's the money? Uh, because they are significantly more expensive, and yeah. often, of course, over the lifetime they're cheaper. But but that's just you know that's not how investment decisions are made, especially not by consumers, even if they are by fleets. But I also want to link the EV conversation to the conversation we were having earlier, uh, which is how how important or how interlinked is the EV story to the power sector and renewable story? Because at the moment they're two parallel conversations that we're having in India, and they're not interlinked. Uh, where really there's, you know, there's, it's not enough just to say, okay, you know what, I'm moving emissions from tailpipe to the thermal power plant, but that is actually what's happening if we don't marry these two conversations to each other. So maybe this will, you know, I know we're almost at time. So this can be kind of the last question I posed to you, uh, both Akshat and Nikhil, what do you think are some of the ways to kind of bring those conversations together and where are, and what are the points at which the conversation should also keep be kept separate because it's there's no point also like you know um, making a mess of things. Um, so yeah, I think the points of convergence and divergence. I would say the emissions point should emissions on power and uh, vehicles should be kept completely separate because what electric vehicles are doing first and foremost for India are cutting air pollution and there is really no more amount of money you would want to throw at this problem because it's a deadly problem and we should really tackle it. Second, even if you do have a fully coal powered fleet of power plants, which we don't, uh, you will still have a uh, per kilometer lower carbon emissions if you're running an electric vehicle. So, you know, there is just from both those perspectives, both from air pollution and emissions, it's a no brainer, we should be moving towards electric vehicles. So we should keep that separate. I think where we should connect them, and this is where we've struggled, not just in India, but globally, is whether they can act as uh, stabilizers for renewable energy, uh, variable re renewable energy on the grid. This sort of idea where you can have a vehicle connect to the grid and feed back uh, power into the grid when the grid requires it and it, the vehicle is sitting and doing nothing. Um, again, there have just been pilot experiments around the world. The difficulty is, in, is figuring out whether the, you know, whether the battery life falls very quickly if you do this for vehicles, because eventually vehicle usage is the key part for a customer participating. And then second is payment uh, methods um, on, on how to uh, compensate people who are providing their vehicles for these services, um, you know, but it's, it's a potential that a potential application that we should definitely be exploring. I have only two points. Uh, one, uh, again, circling back to the core issue of data transparency and market intelligence. We know how much we're generating renewable energy in India. We don't know how much we're consuming, how, how much of Islam is consuming in terms of share of renewables. It's not there in the public. We just know that what are these different plants, uh, RE plants that are located? Because of these lack of visibility of the consumption side from, from these discounts or procurement side, uh, we also see there is uh, problems with tariffs that the discounts are, are, are posing. So, you know, if you see any developed countries, they offer dedicated uh, renewable tariffs, which have like a premium of maybe 0.5 whatever dollar per kilowatt hour 
what a normal car is. In India, we don't have that story. I mean, that also kind of deters uh, both these large customers and these companies which are going to set up these charging stations to be powered with renewable energy. There is no clear accounting uh, on the consumption side. It's only on the generation side. I think that is probably the next thing that, that, is, that kind of, you know, the, the development EV sector definitely hinges on that development uh, sector. Yeah, really good point, actually. Thank you for that, uh, Nikhil. Uh, and thank you, Akshat, for all those excellent interventions. We're at time. And so uh, thank you very much for all of you who have joined us this afternoon, evening, morning, in case you're uh, like Akshat in, in sort of colder countries than we are here in Delhi. Uh, but I think that this has been a really fascinating discussion, uh, not just because data transparency is something that we feel passionately about, but also because we think that an informed discussion is actually going to um, accelerate the pace at which India makes the transition, as well as the quality and efficiency with which this transition is made. We will bring you this handbook every quarter, uh, but please do feel free to write to us in case you have questions and suggestions. There are some unanswered questions left, but we will address them offline and get back to you. Uh, but also very many thanks, Akshat, to you for really explaining the importance of this, these kinds of discussions and, and why this is important, um, this information, but also sort of the context and, and some of the lenses that we should adopt to look at these issues. Um, and thank you, Nikhil, for not just uh, putting this handbook together and bringing it to us now quarter on quarter, uh, but also for your really interesting insights in the process of putting it together, but also what you think is the outlook for the sector. So with that, thank you very much for joining us and we will see you in the next quarter with this handbook and uh, before then for a lot of other updates from the clean energy sectors in India. Thank you very much. Thank you.